Yeah. And the numbers are lower. So 1.3 million people left the country. 700,000 left London. Mm, really? And Yeah. And we'll, I mean, ONS has just published their um, numbers, but we'll see after the um, census how, where we stand. Yeah. Just to but, say everyone that we, we are live on, on Facebook now. <laughs> uh, so, hello. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone watching us. Welcome to our last day of the EU Citizens Festival, which is all with the purpose of encouraging EU citizens to register to vote. Uh, the deadline is tomorrow midnight. Uh, so we're still trying to the, create these informative discussions to attract attention and, and just keep the conversation going so that we inform EU citizens about like the, the local democracy and just general immigration issues in the UK but also that you get registered to vote and encourage anyone that you know that's probably not yet registered to do the same. Um, we've, got, we've got one more formal event today at one with two immigration lawyers, and then later on we might do a catch up on TikTok Alive just to continue encouraging people to engage in the discussion. Um, today is like probably one of my closest to heart topics about the hostile environment, what it is, uh, how it affects migrants in the UK, and most importantly, what kind of actions we can take to, if not necessarily end it, make the lives of immigrants in the UK better. And we've got such an amazing group of organisers, campaigners and activists here uh, that are doing that work. And that can tell us so much more about what they're doing. So in terms of uh, how this event is going to run, um, we're, I'm just going to ask the speakers to introduce themselves. And then we've got a few prepared questions that I'll ask each of them to answer. Uh, but everyone is feel free, feel free to come in, uh, make your points. And anyone in, in, on Facebook, on Zoom, please also ask your questions. Uh, so firstly, I'll just go with the order on my screen. I'll ask Drinka to introduce yourself to our speaker, to our members of the audience, please. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone, on this Sunday morning. This is a proper diehard campaigners. Yeah. Um, my name is Rinka Bralo, and I'm chief executive of Migrants Organize. And Migrants Organize is a platform for migrants and refugees to come together and organize for dignity and justice. And part of what we do is provide direct services to people who need them. And the other part is organizing campaigns and actions to push back against the hostile environment. Thank you. Um, what about you, James? about to start then I realized I was still muted. Hi everyone, I'm James. Uh, I'm the campaign and program lead for health and human rights at MedAct. MedAct is an organization that supports health workers to kind of organize and campaign on a, on a range of issues from climate change to nuclear disarmament to prevent uh, economic justice. Uh, but I look after the access to healthcare stream of work there, which is focused on um, migrant access to healthcare and challenging the hostile environment in the NHS, which I won't Talk to you now because I'm going to spend the next hour talking to you about. <laughs> cool. What about you, Tashi? Um, thanks for introducing us, Lara. I'm Tashi. I am the parliamentary officer of We Belong. Um, and just a little bit of background about We Belong. It's a bit of a different organization. We are led by young people who migrate to the UK. Most of them came as children, but they face barriers to accessing citizenship and rights because of the hostile environment, despite the UK being the only home that they know. And all of our campaigns are led by these young people and our vision is to see them live and be living in the UK and being treated equally and fairly. Um, and I do that through my work by connecting them with MPs um, where they can advocate some of their concerns and campaign for an end to hostile environment. Cool, thank you. Uh, Sunita, please. Hi, I'm Sunita um, and I'm a campaigner with Regularize um, and we're a migrant founded grassroots collective and we're made up of migrants, uh, British citizens and allies. And we're focusing on like a campaign regarding uh, the wanting the government to implement a regularization scheme, something similar to the EU settlement scheme. Um, and as well as trying to like attain right, uh, attain a regularization scheme, we want to improve the quality of life for undocumented migrants. Um, so that's like obviously dealing with 
the issues and the policies around the hostile environment, um, but also like campaigning for a, a more equitable like path to settlement and citizenship for them. Um, and yeah, within that, I do a wide variety of things. Um, as a grassroots collective, we work with lots of different organisations um, and we uh, have many hats and do very many different things. But the importance is like amplifying the voices of um, undocumented migrants and those with lived experience. Cool. Thank you. Um, right. So all of you have mentioned the term hostile environment. It is the title of this event. Uh, the key question is, what is the hostile environment? What is this term that we use so often? Is it an official policy term or has, is it something that just escalated into various different small sets of policies? And yeah, just generally, what is it? How is it affecting um, UK migrants? Uh, I'll start with the same order for this question. Firstly, with the drinker, please. Thank you. So hostile environment is um, government's name for the um, set of measures that um, were introduced in 2014 formally and that's how government branded it they said they wanted to make um, life difficult for um, as they call them illegal migrants um, but then um, they introduced all sorts of enforcement and border control measures into public services and i'm sure we'll hear from james the most egregious one is the um, access to healthcare, um, but also in schools, in universities, in workplaces, um, driver's licenses, housing, people um, struggle to rent properties because um, they need to um, show proof of address. Um, but the hostility in the immigration system, it uh, has been a sort of a theme for a very long time. I remember that as far as 2008, we had um, people that we represented who were charged for um, hospital care, who were maybe refused asylum seekers, or um, not so much undocumented, but underdocumented. And that's what EU citizens are very familiar with, that the government is not very good at issuing proper documentation to people or communicating with other service providers. So then people in public services um, go with a kind of lowest common denominator and stop providing services to people. And Windrush scandal is the prime example of implementation of the hostile environment, of how it sort of affected and um, made effectively um, people who lived in this country sometimes for 50 years, made them undocumented and excluded from all sorts of services. And we've seen how you know, people lost their lives because they couldn't access um, healthcare or they were charged for healthcare. So um, there was an attempt to rebrand hostile environment at one point into compliant environment. But there is an interesting thing that is happening that I've just picked up now in the last couple of weeks, which is <clears throat> another attempt to rebrand hostile environment, which is called the New Plan for Immigration which was launched by the Home Secretary and a consultation was launched um, on the 24th of March and ending on the day of local elections and mayoral elections, which is 6th of May, which is very interestingly talking about a lot about fairness and um, genuine refugees, but also criminalization and further punishment for people who um, make their way to this country in, in the way that government deems illegal or inappropriate, uh, which we can talk about a bit later, but there is no mention of hostile environment in the new plan for immigration, which is very interesting. Um, but the um, it's so deeply embedded and also the damage has been done already because the people's perceptions are that um, most immigrants are here illegally and they shouldn't be here and they're doing something wrong and we should push against them or somehow restrict their rights, access to services. And in, in you know, what that does to people is devastating. It's absolutely devastating. And I'm, I'm sure between us, we have many examples, but we have people who've been stuck in the system sometimes for 10 years destitute, um, have to report even during pandemic because they're technically out on bail 
and also have to survive on 35 pounds, 37 pounds a week now. Um, they're first forced to live in the housing that's provided by contractors, usually private firms, very frequently firms that run prisons and detention centers, so conditions are terrible. But then we've seen that also that extended to European citizens who are now facing um, a cut off date and many are very vulnerable and struggled with uh, registering, but also not actually having a proof of status. National insurance numbers are not being issued on time. So people are struggling with um, finding jobs or getting paid. So um, it's, it's a massive um, onslaught on everyone who uh, the government deems not to, that shouldn't be here. So ideal immigrant is the one who's not here under the hostile environment so i'll stop there i could go on for mm. a long time but um i can pick up some of these threads later in conversation yeah definitely i've been putting some other points down just questions that come to my mind that i can ask later as well uh, but just for the sake of like understanding the, this term a little bit more and how it's applied uh i'd like james to come in as well and explain um, how it affects his job but like just your perspective on on what it is and your interpretation of it sure so I think the things I'd add to what Shrinker has said is I think uh, the hostile environment really is is um, the latest iteration of a long line of policies that are designed uh, to do two things I think at their core what the first is to um, integrate immigration control with public services in an incredibly streamlined way and uh, in order to mobilize all people that work in kind of the public sector as agents of immigration enforcement and border control um, and to start to blur the lines between the external borders and internal borders and to kind of mobilize uh, as many people as possible into a kind of like policing or punitive role in the state. Um, and it does that very well by kind of essentially assigning legal duty for lots of people, health workers, teachers, you know, land, private landlords to suddenly take on these activities of border control. Um, and then the other thing that it works to do is to mobilize racism and anti-migrant hostility to undermine the principles of uh, the like the sorry, of, of public services and of the state so that to kind of challenge people's understanding of what entitlement to public services means or what the kind of a rights-based access to services means um, and to increasingly put a requirement on people to prove their entitlement to access them um, in this phase mostly targeting well they, say, they frame it as mostly targeting migrant communities, but the reality is actually that these policies target many more people, people who are racialized living in this country or people who are underdocumented. Um, but it's obviously also part of a continuation of undermining the principles of their services in general um, and embedding in us the understanding that we aren't entitled to them as default, that we have to prove or demonstrate or like meet certain criteria to be able to be, to be, able to access them. Um, and in doing so, open up doors for privatization and reduction of services. The final thing I'd say is I think the thing that sets the hostile environment apart from the rest of these policies that extend you know, from the 80s um, is that the hostile environment also relies on kind of elaborate networks of data sharing and communication between government departments that uh, make it increasingly impossible to avoid all of the different elements of the system or to kind of ever show up in any part of society without suddenly being uh, shot to the home office, which maybe I'll get into more later. But yeah no we've got a comment just on this point there's a very good point it makes public services your enemy and pushes you off the grid uh i'll come to you tashi next can you explain to us uh, yeah um, i think anything Jinka, that you can add yes i think Jinka and james have done an amazing job of explaining i think in policy terms what the 2014 hostile environment um, is and I, I guess my addition to it would be that you know this was a is something that we kind of have to think about not just in terms of the conservative policies that um, Theresa May has laid out in 2014 it's actually successive government policies including labour policies um, that have put this hostility on onto migrants it was actually labour that coined the term hostile environment and used it first in parliament um, and I'll briefly speak about Thing um, immigration policies outside um, of of the 2014 Act that are still very unpleasant and hostile to immigrants, and um, especially 
you know, the hostile environment was was set on on two bases to um, stop like irregular migrants and documented migrants from being able to access essentials of ordinary life so that they would then voluntarily leave it actually has done the opposite of that and voluntary leave has ha has gone down and um, I would go as far to say that those policies have actually added to the undocumented population and increased it quite a bit um, so the other current parts of immigration policy which aren't quite termed hostile were still termed hostile environment but not within those policies um, include like astronomically high immigration fees which mean that those that are undocumented or those that are actually still in status um, can't afford to keep themselves in status um, and end up becoming undocumented and subject to the hostile environment. Um, and with additional policies of having, you know, things like indefinite in, uh, detention and forced separation of families, um, it goes far beyond their target population of just targeting undocumented uh, the undocumented population. And I would say that status is so much more fluid than being categorized in those that are undocumented, those that are not undocumented. Many people become undocumented, have um, are on a path to settlement to start with. And because of the policies in place, actually end up losing their status. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that's that would be my addition. Yeah, that that's a very good point. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sunitha, please. Yeah, I think what Tashi said about how um it's important for people to understand that people often like migrants have had status at some point is really it's not necessarily the narrative that's given from the government or the media. I think a lot of people assume because of how it's um, been portrayed that people come through quote unquote like illegal means and they like the the images that we see often of like uh, boats and things that's the kind of that's what's in the public mind and public uh in general feel like that's how people arrive but yeah I think it's important to understand that in the, that period of time between like um after the immigration act 2014 and 2016 people became undocumented because of the policies that were in place and became destitute because you know people had rights to they weren't necessarily being checked regarding like their workplaces or their housing and when people don't have access to essentially what these are basic like requirements to live then they become like at risk of um being undocumented but also they have like become risk of being very vulnerable to exploitation they have like precarious lives obviously in the pandemic we've seen how mm -hmm. um people who don't have access to public funds and those are people that's a quite, quite like right across the spectrum, people who are undocumented, people who have limited to re leave to remain, but have in their, um, they have a no recourse to public funds within their visa. There are so many people that have not been able to access things like furlough schemes and a lot of um, welfare state that we have as British citizens that gives us a blank, like a, a security blanket in times of need, like the pandemic. This has really exacerbated people's experiences under the pandemic. Um, and I think even like we've been doing a lot of work around vaccine access and healthcare. And obviously, although the government has made assurances around vaccine access and has said that free, there is going to be free, there has been free access to healthcare in anything related to COVID-19, the hostile environment policies have worked so effectively in theory that they act as like a barrier for um, undocumented migrants to access healthcare. The people that have died because they're scared to come forward. But there's also cases of people just not being able to register with GPs um, as like obviously other people on the panel have like knowledge of. Um, and also because of not having access to healthcare, obviously COVID has disproportionately affected people with underlying conditions. And if you don't have access to healthcare um, because you're not registered with GP, those conditions can be left untreated and therefore people are more likely to uh, have serious illness or at, at the worst die from COVID-19. And I think this is the reality. Um, we're in unprecedented times at the pandemic, and this has affected people's life in quite detrimental ways. But this was happening before the pandemic. This has just exposed those um, kind of cruelties of the system further, I think. Yeah, I, I 
I, I've seen that uh, happen, especially, I think Tasha will know this very well as, as well, with we, we young children born in the UK to parents of undocumented migrants. There, there's a lot of fear of, of reaching out to the authorities to register that child or to give that child the necessary status and documents that, that it just furthers and furthers the undocumented status of a lot of them. Um, but I guess I, my next question is a little bit less focused on, on policy and a little bit more focused on, I guess, like rhetoric and public opinion or, or whatever reason you think this set of policies have come about. Like, why was this hostile environment created in the UK? And I'll mix around the order. I'll start with James, please. So racism, I suppose, is the, is the straightforward answer if we want to keep it short. But no, I think um, governments have, you know, historically and for a long time mobilized racism, anti, like anti-migrant sentiment to further various policy positions or objectives that they have. Um, and I think we need to see the hostile environment as part of a kind of broader attempt by the government, both to restrict public services, as I said already, um, but also to kind of uh, mobilize that sentiment to, to uh, give them the perception of, you know, being kind of tough on law and order or like kind of strong and like, you know, have this sense of like strong and powerful government that um, is manifested through this idea that they can control access both to the country, but also to the things within the country that people value, like the NHS. Um, and unfortunately, what they also do is they combine that narrative with a narrative of austerity um, and a narrative of economic necessity to try and justify these policies then in terms that people feel able to stand behind because no one wants to stand here for, well a lot of people do very few people feel comfortable to stand up and say we don't want migrants to use any services in the country but they do feel a lot more comfortable to say we we'd love to allow everyone to use our services but we just can't afford it mm. it's just impo simply impossible um and that is such a, a kind of powerful myth of, both uh, sitting in the kind of context of austerity that we've been living in for a long time and this you know, permanent idea of scarcity. Um, and then applying that to this idea that uh, it's migrant populations that generate that scarcity um, really allows people to get behind it and is very, uh, like very, very powerful. Obviously, in the reality is that it's uh, complete, a complete falsehood. Austerity anyway of itself is like a fairly, a fairly flawed uh, economic understanding, but particularly in this, in the context of the hostile environment, restricting people's ability to access services and live their lives in this country, um, on the whole is more costly, even if you look at it only purely from an economic, like, do I want the NHS to have more money or less money at the end of the year, restricting people's ability to access care on the NHS, ultimately leads to having less money, um, but in ways that are more direct, like indirect. So it's much harder to kind of argue that positionality on it. So essentially the hostile environment sets up a, a situation where we are, uh, forced to argue for, you know, the kind of like moral and ideological case of, or we want to argue for the moral and ideological case of why people should be entitled to access these services all the time, um, but are pushed into an economic argument that becomes very difficult to win because it's very difficult to evidence why is it the economic, the kind of truisms of austerity and scarcity are very hard to overcome in that kind of discourse. Um, so it's unusual for, for governments of, of kind of very smart and well thought through selection of policies that make it very difficult for us to argue against them. Mm -hmm. Mm, yes, it really is, as, as I think all of us in here know quite well. Um, can I get to Tashi next, please? Yeah, um, I think James is, is completely right in, in saying that, you know, the government really doesn't think through most of its policies. And if it, if it did, I don't think it would enact um, policies that didn't have any effect on, on what they were actually attending, um, intending to do. Um, I would say it's quite, it is quite a difficult question to ask, why does it actually exist? Um, it, there was probably quite a big political narrative. Um, you know, we had just gone through um, a recession and unemployment was really high and immigration was seen as a scapegoat um, for people to say, oh, we don't you know, they're having a hard life where they're unable to get a job. And it was just, it's just so much easier to blame your problems onto the other. And that's why there was quite a lot of political momentum within the conservative government to do something about immigration. Um, but they went through, you know, a, a route that would make them look tough, but would, would do nothing about actually helping the lives 
of the people that that thought this way um so um i think it it's it's um um a difficult question to answer but <laughs> um but but on the whole i think the public narrative as Rinka mentioned at the start you know it has kind of taken a turn for the more positive um with with the NHS and migrant workers really pushing the movement for 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 COVID and immigration has dropped down the list of priorities that the public think are an issue to Britain so I think there's really hope and scope for us to to challenge these um these policies yeah I'm aware it's a little bit of a difficult question but yeah. <laughs> I spent my my whole last year of university doing an immigration paper and <laughs> there's a lot more than a, an hour long webinar but of course uh, it's important for us to cover at least a little bit of it uh, so Sunita next please yeah I think just to echo what um, other people have said I think it definitely feels like the government used this as a way to appear to be tough on migration but it's also important that this wasn't something that came from the conservative uh, government and obviously a lot of these policies came through as a result of the, the coalition government this is um also happened because labor has appeared to be um it's become a contentious issue to discuss migration it's become like and particularly we we understand with like undocumented migrants it's particularly taboo to talk about it and so because there isn't discussions that in this way i think it has become and obviously a lot of these policies don't impact british citizens and so unless you're interacting with the immigration system you just have no understanding of what the impact is for people in like reality um obviously there's a very there's a rhetoric of they're coming here and taking our jobs and also claiming benefits when the reality is mostly they are coming here to people come here to work and doing jobs unfortunately because of the hostile environment policies are doing jobs where they are at risk of being vulnerable um, and being of being exploited they don't have labor rights in the same way that a lot of us do um, and i think it is just it's been a way to create this division between british citizens and migrants and it's a as, as tashi said like a way to scapegoat a group of people and this has happened through history and it's it's not unusual um, obviously, like for us and for a lot of us, as we are going through coming out of the pandemic, migrants are hugely important and a fabric of society. And, the, you know, we understand with like carers and cleaners, they've been a huge part of um, supporting and uh, managing the, this pandemic. And I think hopefully there's opportunity for um, that to actually be portrayed within the public sphere. But I think, yeah, it's very, I think it was, it's very hard to understand why exactly the government wanted to do this. Um, I think, yeah, like it, it's just a way to, to avoid discussing what they have done in terms of policies um, and reflecting it on another group of people. But yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that we say that it doesn't affect British citizens, but in reality, they are very much in accessing, seeing people every day that might not have a, a status in the UK it can be their domestic cleaner it can be someone that is helping build their home and they're very much part of of this whole system and and should definitely take an interest in how the people that are there with them every day are affected by it uh, so lastly on this question drinker please well I would just add you know to everything that's been said that part of the challenge is that I've been doing this for 27 years and I've been listening to the same argument of scapegoating at different times and if you dig through the history you will find even now that the same language that's been used about refugees now has been used in 1939 so there you know there's always that um sort of framing of the other um, which is also in this country very racialized. Um, this is a very unique country. We have three types of citizenship. Um, why not just have one? Why do we need to have these distinctions? Um, but I think that what I've learned and what's been the challenge in, in working and campaigning for uh, migrant justice is that we don't really have much power and we um, cannot vote when we can we don't so here's another plug uh, for people to register to vote um, 
And also we're very, uh, it's not a kind of homogenous group. So you have all sorts of people from different countries who arrived at different times, who have different history uh, from the sort of colonial, post-colonial migration to new migration, to refugees, to students, to economic migration. So um, we're in, we don't have organic movement that works together. And that's because when as a group of people you're pressed and oppressed which is what's basically happening you then fire you're firefight and there's very little time left to organize properly and until we have that critical power to move our representatives um it's going to be hard for us to be taken seriously and for mps to respond and we can only do that through building alliances with each other, but also with um, with other supporters in civil society and then general public. And you can see sometimes there are moments where we where we get to that rapture when people just wake up, like with Windrush scandal. And but then it's very it, it, what government did very cleverly is just focused on that particular group mm -hmm. as if that's not going to happen to um, lots of EU citizens in July. So we, we go over the same scenario because they can get away with, oh, well, this is very special case. Um, but what we're talking about is institutional and structural racism, exclusion and oppression, because it's very easy to scapegoat us. And then, especially with people who are undocumented, underdocumented, it's basically psychological torture. So it's very hard um, to speak out because you need some kind of form of protection. And um, when we speak out, our individual experiences are often then classified as just that, as anecdotal mm. individual experiences. And what we need to be doing much more in addition to building alliances and working together is, is speaking together. Because every time you unpick any thread of any issue that um, people who are othered in society are experiencing, you will come to the core of it, which is institutional racism and hostile environment. So um, part of the challenges is how do we increase systems literacy in our movement? How do we build a movement to start with that's coherent, that it has a vision that is strong, that has a set of principles, but most importantly, that's united around the systemic change. For us, it's very difficult because we're all drawn into hundreds of different directions, firefighting, and especially during the pandemic. So we're ready, we started doing some of that, um, or we're much better at it. Um, another challenge is that we don't really, like we can always say that we're not party political because all political parties are pretty much the same on the issue of immigration because it's perceived as something that public is against. Mm -hmm. And again, we need some leadership there. We need to build um, build stronger uh, coalitions that will increase understanding. We are actually all affected by it. If you think about the, you know, people, you know, everybody's married, related to, knows someone who is um, who has um, some kind of migration experience or the story. But people kind of are okay with that one person or three people that they know, but the three million that they don't know are scary. Um, so we need, there's a lot of work to be done um, and we need to be savvier in how we present that argument. So yes, we, you know, even people are not very good at responding to numbers. And what we've learned from colleagues in the US is how when they organize, when they build coalitions, when they organize low propensity immigrant voters, it pays off in terms of policies afterwards, but also people feel empowered. So they will, you know, challenge, you know, on day to day racism as well as systemic racism. Mm. So a, a lot of work to be done, but it's not impossible. Yeah, that, definitely. Um, I mean, you've, you've done really, a really good plug to the next point of the conversation that we will have, which is about what happened before 2014. We, we talk about the hostile environment as if it was something that before that, the UK was a perfect place for, for migrants. Uh, when in reality, as, as you've mentioned, um, all the 
new labor labor in the past they were they weren't so great with migrants either and as, as far as i know even in the 1940s 50s there were like big advertisements to um other countries that the uk wasn't a good place to come to trying to disencourage migrants to come to the uk um so maybe i'll start with sunita next um what is the policy background to the hostile environment has it always been in the uk just with different terminologies and different framings yeah i think like it's important to like as you said it's not something that the conservative government brought in it's something that they solidified i guess in the like 2014 this has kind of been shifting with different governments in terms of um migration and 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 yes as you said it's always been a thing um you know i've got family members that came from and, and relatives and community, a community that came from Sri Lanka and at the time it was really like um, viewed like hostility there's a lot of hostility towards Tamils coming from Sri Lanka and so yes it's not something new um, um, I think it's very easy to particularly with migrants who are visibly different it's easy to kind of criminalize a group of people in that way uh, I just think it yeah during that period it was between you know after the conservative government and the coalition that was a period where that was like solidified within law and i think it's important to kind of acknowledge that other parties have been um have have had a like a role to play in this and it's important that we actually do have like zinka said like the opposition needs to take a tougher stance on this and that's all opposition parties and um, and it is a, it is a, incredibly taboo to discuss i i recognize that um, even for in migrant spaces, talking about undocumented migrants or underdocumented migrants is not necessarily the narrative that takes um, precedence. And I think one thing that has been good during this period is that, yes, okay, it's been very difficult for a lot of migrants and it's not to, um, the, the experience of the pandemic has exacerbated their situation, that's really important to acknowledge. But there has been an opportunity for people to connect and you know some people live alone they don't discuss their status with other people especially if they're undocumented and it's something that they have to trust people to say something about that because just having that status puts them in danger but there has been an opportunity for people to connect and it is very important for people who are undocumented or underdocumented to be able to self-organize and because of the policies and the invisible nature of it it isn't like other issues in the same way where people can be visible and discuss their their oppression. And I think that's the kind that is unfortunately what happened during the hostile environment policies. It is essentially created a situation where people have no feeling where they can talk about their rights. You know, whenever we're discussing people with lived experience, we have to always, even when we have like webinars and things, we always have to be protective of their, their identity. Mm -hmm. They can't mm -hmm. be seen and can't be, can't speak out in the same way that, you know, when we're talk when a lot of people discuss other issues, they're able to be visible. And, and that is really important. And it is really important, as Ring said, to have these human stories because these are human beings that are affected. They're not just random statistics. These are people that we know. We might not know that they're undocumented or underdocumented, but that is important to kind of recognize. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even even in, in my in my Brazilian community in the early 2000s, like I when when I first arrived in the UK, I could see the, the fear that some undocumented migrants had in telling even other Brazilians in the UK, because you always have a little bit of a fear that someone will report you. It's it's not great. Um I'll, I'll come to Zrinka next, please. So as I said before, it goes way, way back historically. And when you think about all immigration laws are about exclusion, they're about a control. So that's part of the, the, the narrative. There was a time when we didn't have borders <laughs> and could travel, but nobody's talking about that. Um, so what I would say is that um, it is really important for us to not allow for this to be normalized even further. So as much as we, so we, we as advocates, as organizers, as campaigners, we need to be repeating um, until, you know, people actually hear us and not to be silenced by a, a continuous push, which when you do this all the time, it can be exhausting. And then uh, create safe spaces for people to be able to discuss it. Um, and, you know, if, if you think about, 
any big campaign has started with three people in, in somebody's living room talking about their issues. That's how Amnesty International was created. Um, that's how dreamers came out in the US with one person saying in the classroom, well, I'm not going to go to university because I'm going to become a cleaner because I'm undocumented. So it's really, really, that's the kind of the foundation of everything that we do is to create safe environment. And, you know, I know with We Belong, that's how it started with, with you know, two or three people speaking out and then suddenly lots of people coming out and the same thing happened with Windrush. So um, we must not be discouraged um, from fe that feeling that we're starting from scratch because we're not. And the, uh, the second challenge is, is that there are millions of people in this country who are not only migrants or related to migrants and refugees, but also who want to welcome people. So we need to provide spaces where that can happen in an organized way, because a lot of people are confused and know what to do. And also, especially in faith communities with, uh, with whom we do a lot of work with all faith, um, faith groups, is that it's the nature of doing good work is to do it quietly. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. We don't want to change that sort of like people boasting about it. But it's very important for us to then tap into that as a resource and do that sort of broader education and change on one to one basis so that we all have a clear set of goals. So we, we started doing that. And I'm pleased to say that everyone on this call has signed up to Fair Immigration Reform Movement Charter, which is an attempt to list here's everything that we want. It's only like 35 bullet points. So it's not impossible. And four principles are dignity, justice, welcome, and action. So it's not enough just for, for us to be talking about it, but to have concrete action steps and also to be prepared for this for the long haul. And then just I saw some questions in the chat about EU settled status and what we can do. It's really important for us to um, adopt the mindset that we need to be pushing. So right to your MP make demands, write to the Home Office, become a nuisance in terms of writing and demanding your rights, because that's the only way, even if you do, write to newspapers, write blogs, write social media posts, because if we suffer in silence, nothing ever is going to change. So um, we have discovered um, a couple of years ago that a lot of people have been reported to the enforcement, uh, immigration enforcement, when they went to see their MPs and uh, to seek advice and representation. And we pushed back really hard. We got MPs to sign up not to do that, but also we put in a complaints to different standards bodies. And although it is a small number of MPs, a lot of people were shocked and felt that that's something mm. unacceptable. So we need to be tapping into those kind of, how is this treatment of people who are different and um, who, uh, who are you sort of excluded, how it's damaging our democracy and our society and who's gonna be next? Yeah. Because and once you experiment on a group of people who, can, who don't have a voice, then immediately it moves on to another vulnerable group of people in society. So it is an issue for all of us um, to, to be um, working on and pushing back on. It's not just, you know, here's the issue in the corner that doesn't really matter. It's absolutely essential. Yeah, and I think uh, just seeing Kathleen's comments here in the chat, um, about EU citizens, I think it's really, really important that we understand the hostile environment because even though EU citizens have had a little bit more of a privileged position within the UK immigration system, this is something that will likely affect thousands and thousands of EU citizens from the 1st of July. And just to add, you can see how easily through one act of man-made um, legislation, which is what has happened to people who are ill, what has happened to people who refuse asylum, what has happened to Windrush. It just, you know, overnight, your outlook. Yeah. 
And I think that is so uh, what we need to remember is that it can easily also be remade mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. into a more humane, fair and functioning system. But we need to be reclaiming what fair means yeah. and what functioning and, and what humane and what justice means in that context. Um, yeah, guess James next, please. So uh, there's a couple of things I was going to pick up on. I think one, the question around, yeah, kind of EU citizens versus migrants. I think often for us, when we when we talk about these issues and these policies, um, we use the, the kind of broadest possible sense of the term migrant. And we do that in a very deliberate way, because as Sunita said, oftentimes people won't talk or just forget about to talk or deliberately avoid talking about undocumented migrants um, or like focus on, you know, asylum seekers and refugees. Or, you know, increasingly there's a focus on EU citizens and the relation of settled status and immigration system. And actually all of those things are designed to just sow division and kind of reinforce narratives about who deserves and who doesn't deserve to be included in whichever structure. And the, as Rinka says, the ability to kind of close and open those doors is so easy and so fluid that it's actually not, it's not useful. And for us, the, the kind of uh, tinkering around the edges and trying to, you know, modify bits of policies or law to kind of make things a bit more just for people that are, in, you know, somehow slightly closer in the Venn diagram of inclusion uh, is completely redundant and isn't helpful ultimately. So, you know, the until the kind of way we engage in like the idea of migration is fundamentally different, we don't see any use of like picking off certain people to talk about, which is why, I've, at least for me, I've been using the word migrant in the broader sense for the entire discussion. Um, the thing I was going to say about the kind of background of, of the hostile environment, um, the, it's it's a fight as of, at least in the NHS is a fight as old as the NHS itself. Um, even in the initial kind of parliament, and the kind of person that reads nineteen forties parliamentary logs. Um, so even in the original like debates around the NHS and the introduction of the NHS Act in nineteen forty eight, uh, you know right wing politicians were arguing for the need to restrict access to migrants. Uh, and Ewan Bevan, for all of his own uh, racism, which is relatively well documented. Um, he did push for the NHS to be open to everyone, um, both as much on an ideological position as a practical position. He, he could see that it was for it to work, it was necessary for it to be truly universal, um, even though he was a eugenicist. So I don't know what that says about politicians we have today, but like, I don't know, someone somewhere has lost their way a little bit. He was he ended up resigning as a result of them trying to bring in charges to the NHS a few years later, and that, that struggle has gone on. So, um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to touch on, I think, it's also worth remembering that the, as far back as the history of these racist immigration policies goes, there's also resistance to them that goes back just as far. Um, and I think it's easy to kind of forget or sometimes lose these things in the in the kind of mists of history. And actually, we are all involved in a, in a legacy of really radical work to try and change these policies. Um, and in the in the UK, in the NHS, in the 1980s, there was a movement called No Pass Laws Here who kind of emerged to fight back against the first round, the first really serious round of the introduction of charging into the NHS. Um, and in much the same way as we are now, you know, building coalitions across the country, kind of working together, um, arguing against these policies, not just on a kind of moral and ideological level, but also from a, you know, anti-colonial principle that, um, you know, no one who is here owes the British state anything. And the British state owes everyone a lot. <laughs> and the idea that they should be trying to restrict access to the services on the, because people are exploiting them or kind of drawing too much for them is, is completely ridiculous. And I think it's it's useful for us to remember that because we can carry that over into our arguments now and continue that legacy in, in the work that we do. Yeah, thank you. I think Tashi is last on this point. I just unmuted my screen, I think. Mm -hmm. Unmuted? Yeah, yeah. yeah. speak. <laughs> Um, I think everybody else has just made fantastic points, um, you know, not as well, not just pointing out the problems with subsequent policy, but also actions that we can take to um, to prevent it. I mean, I, I think it's no question that this goes way beyond conservative policies. You know, Labour, I think, has had a had a mug um, in Ed Miliband, which is Miliband state that said like, controls on immigration or, um, or something. Um, so again um it's it is it is a fight <laughs> and it can be um quite daunting when we think about um how negative policies have been but um 
I just want to echo what everyone else has said, you know, it's really, really important that we engage with both sides of the political spectrum and we we actually have seen much more success when we don't just go on the argument side but also like Zinka said like the value side so with her free immigration charter the value of fairness um, which both sides of the political spectrum can really engage with and understand and we spoke you know briefly about this not this affecting not really affecting British citizens also making the argument that you know in, in some cases it, it does affect British citizens we've had cases of young people who have had um, British citizenship but have actually been denied healthcare because um, just because of the color of their skin or because the NHS didn't go as far enough to check check their documents and there are many cases like that um, you know, um, when it comes to the hostile environment policies and the right to rent schemes and how those discriminate on basis of just looking at people's names um, and saying that there's too much effort to to try and check whether they have immigration papers or not. And and making the arg arguments that, that it's not just, you know, the other and a few pe people that are that are affected. Um, and um, and as we've spoken, you know, part of our work is 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 just informing and educating um, politicians about the policies that they've put in place. Because some of them will just will just see, you know, a couple of words online. Oh, this sounds like a sensible idea, but not understanding the repercussions. And I know we've been, we've been doing you know a great job of that. And as Dunker said, we we just need to push. Um, and and get the word out there and not just kind of the really key point I think is not just speak into our own bubble you know our own bubble of migration activists and, and our own bubble of people that we know will um will agree with us and will just nod our heads but to speak to the people that are a bit more hesitant um and bring them a little bit more more to our sides and our, our arguments and also understand their points of views because even though they we might not agree with their conclusions um uh, but just to understand where they may be coming from so we can better understand what kind of arguments or what kind of things that we need to to put forward to win them over yes yes it's definitely something that we should be doing um, my next point is just um, would like us to bring some some examples or some case studies to kind of illustrate what we've been talking about. Um, as, as we said, we can't be, of course, completely open about who we're talking about. Um, but I think it's important for us to to bring those stories about how exactly the hostile environment affects uh, migrants in the UK. So I don't know, I'll, I'll leave this open to any of you who, who wanted to bring something uh, not all of you have to speak on this, but anyone wants to start? Well, perhaps I can start with an example because the question has been raised about migrants and EU citizens. Yeah, yes, please. And I think it's important to clarify that, you know, we use this language because these are the labels given to us. Yeah. And as, you know, we've gone through a, a period of time where EU citizens were not migrants in the same sense as some other immigrants were, but things have changed. So how, how that has changed is that we have a Home Secretary who announced that she has ended freedom of movement and she takes pride in that. So it's, it, I think what we're talking about is that insidious nature of how power governments politics is played out and what impact it has on people's lives and how that changes. So in that, in that sense, the position of EU citizens has changed dramatically and they're now subject to immigration control in a way they haven't been before Brexit and before it was formalized. So um, it is what state does that changes our rights and our entitlements and our access to services. And one of the things that we have done, we have challenged, for example, we had serious concerns at Migrants Organize, we do a lot of work on mental health, and we've discovered a gap in the system around mental capacity. And we first discovered that with very traumatized people who um, very frequently had to represent themselves in immigration appeals. 
um, because um, we haven't mentioned, but legal aid and legal advice is almost non-existent out mm -hmm. there for all groups of migrants and other vulnerable people um, as a result of years of austerity and how that was prioritized. So what we discovered is that people who in criminal system, criminal justice system would have a mental capacity litigation friend appointed by the court did not have that level of protection in immigration appeals. So we started developing that program where we help assess and work with Ministry of Justice because it is in the function of justice. Otherwise we talk about failure of justice if people um, people's rights are not protected. And in that same vein, what we've discovered is that there are around 7,000 EU citizens officially diagnosed with dementia. And we've um, challenged the government um, through the judicial review about how are these people protected um, in terms of doing their um, settlement registration on phones, um, not having the papers, not remembering where they, you know, it's just, a, it's a total minefield. So when we issued a pre-action letter, the government chose not to, um, not to respond. So mm -hmm. clearly they haven't done their um, thinking and research around some of the more vulnerable people. And then um, our judicial review has just been, oral hearings just been um, rejected and we're appealing because the judge said that we need to wait for discrimination to happen in July, which I'm sure it will. But it's also a question of how we're gonna bring these cases forward because people are vulnerable. Will they be able, so will only when they start being refused services and access to services, because they're not able to produce the phone with, with a code or letter. So, um, so it's a very long battle, but a lot of the time things need to get worse and then we have to prove them in order to, to win. And um, those of us who work in this field know that there have been numerous judicial reviews and we're using that as a way of pushing back. But also we have seen rhetoric from the government pushing back and calling um, lawyers activist lawyers mm. who are frustrating the system. So that's, you know, that's also because we are achieving something through this avenue. Um, but the danger is that they're going to close that through legislation and rules. Um, so it's, a, it's an ongoing battle um, to find stories um, and also to protect vulnerable people because what we cannot do is be exploitative. So, um, so in, in that, it's a very long process. So, you know, whoever comes forward will look for people to support. And, you know, James can talk about how difficult that is in, in access to healthcare as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and anyone else next? I guess James, would you like to come in next? Maybe that's my cue, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think uh, it's, it's a very kind of fraught and, and complicated field, I think, talking about like raising examples of the impact of the hostile environment, not just for, for kind of individual safety, but also I think because the way often that is done kind of generates this victimized, like victimized narrative that, that puts people in a place of no agency. Um, and what has been really important for us in some of our work is, is thinking about how we uh, support people to challenge that and take back control both of their own narrative, but also of the kind of narrative of how uh, their communities are challenging these policies collectively. Um, these policies work to individualize and isolate and kind of obscure people from view when they're experiencing the sharp end of the hostile environments. So how do we you know, both make it visible and recollectivize the response to it? Um, and that took us to working with a, with a really incredible um, person called Simba, who is a, a guy that lives in Sheffield. He um, came to this country when he was 14, um, initially to uh, claim asylum. And that's been a long, as it often is, a long and drawn out process that um, currently he's in a, in a position where he is a refused asylum seeker. Um, he lives with his family. So he's been here for over 10 years now, almost 15 years. Um, and unfortunately for Simba, Simba has like a, a long-standing blood clotting condition, so his uh, blood doesn't clot properly. And what that meant was that he would, you know, kind of be getting bits of bleeding and, and kind of inappropriate things. He was seeing his GP and getting some treatment for that, and his GP needed to refer him to some secondary specialist care um, to get proper treatment for this condition. And obviously at that point, what Simba realised is that suddenly he was no longer eligible for that care. Um, he started receiving large bills, thousands of pounds. Um, as a refused asylum seeker, he's unable to work. So 
he was understandably like very concerned both about the impact these bills would have on him and what it means and how you know he didn't want to be someone that had a big debt to the nhs um so as most people would do he stopped he stopped going for care he stopped attending altogether um he also got very stressed out about the debt that he had accrued during this time and so he uh, what this did is it kind of put him into a spiral that ended up with him uh, having a massive stroke um, mm. in June of 2019 that uh, led to him being taken to intensive care, was in a coma for two weeks, had to have a large part of his skull removed to relieve the swelling on his brain. It was a really significant uh, traumatic event that happened to him. Uh, and then when he woke up in intensive care two weeks later, the hospital presented him with a bill for £93,000 um, for the care that he received for his stroke. And that process is ongoing now for, for the kind of further care that he had. And it was after this that we came into contact with him through um, some of the excellent organisers at Migrants Organise. Thank you, Jinka. Um, who uh, made contact and, and Simba, you know, he uh, his initial kind of the initial things that he said to us was that he, he, it was, he thought it was important to tell his story, but he thought it was important to tell his story so that no one else had to go through that again. And so that um, that his story could be used and mobilised to get rid of the entirety of NHS charging policy and the hostile environment. And I think that's a really like, powerful and brave position to be coming from. He, that, that's almost more important to him than getting rid of his own bill for the care that he has, although he obviously also wants to do that. Um, and so we've been supporting him to kind of launch this campaign, the Justice for Simba campaign that we that they run in Sheffield now. Um, and it's mobilised, you know, vast sections of the community around, around his care, I think has put the hospital on uh, fairly shaky ground. I think they're very concerned about Simba and what he's doing there um, in order to challenge the care that he has. But it's also, you know, inspired people around the country. So I think it's, you know, mobilised lots of different campaigns in different communities and, you know, people, you know, as far south as Brighton are standing in solidarity with him and getting Simba posters up around the town. Um, and I think it's those places where you get to take these stories and turn them into something bigger and something that mm. becomes part of a movement. Um, both for mobilizing campaigns and campaigners, but also for other people who are experiencing things like Simba seeing that and saying, oh, actually, like I'm not on my own and I'm like, there are structures in place that can kind of support me that I can get involved in that are going to help resolve some of this um, and start to challenge these policies. And I think it's really, yeah, incredible work and really delightful to be involved in. Um, and one of the less sad stories of the pilot stories that I have in my brain. Yeah, exactly. Because um, I think sometimes the the process of like identifying an undocumented migrant and removing them from the country so quick so fast that there isn't even the time for that story to be raised and for it to be talked about and it's so damaging as I speak from personal experience that I had a flatmate who um, was deported back to Brazil um, and it was done in, in a period of like four days and it was just like one day he went to work and then he didn't come back home that day because he was sent to a uh, detention center and there wasn't like it was just such a shocking experience but there wasn't the time to to organize around that and it, i think those stories just don't even come out most of the time um i think sunita you had your you, you were starting to speak before as well yeah um so like we had uh, an example like obviously you've been doing a lot of work in uh, vaccine access and during that period, it was kind of seen that the only way to get access to vaccine was through um, registering with a GP. So we had an undocumented uh, person who was struggling for like almost three months just to register with the GP. Um, and he was so motivated, he just wanted to get the COVID vaccine. And was really, that was like why he had decided to, to register with the GP. But um, when he first went to register with the GP, because he, was, he disclosed that he was undocumented, he was told to leave the premises. And then like subsequent visits to different GPs, because it was not, he was a freeze that time. Um, they, they asked for home addresses and they were like unwilling and uh, to register him as a, uh, as a patient, even though like it's not a, like a statutory requirement to ask for proof of address. And like finally, which is amazing, um, he was able to register with the GP um, and his GP like flagged up that maybe he, like on an initial assessment, then maybe he should see a psychiatrist. Um, and so when he went and did that, he was actually detained under the Mental Health Act. And at that point was asked for ID documents. And like we it, like we had a week, it was on a weekend and we, uh, like uh, this person contacted us and we were quite like concerned. Um, obviously, like when someone's in a situation where they're 
they have been um, detained under mental health act. They're, they're, they're quite severe in terms of like their mental health illness. Um, but the only concern this person was having at that particular moment was like, what's going to happen? Like, are the Home Office going to be called? And that was their primary concern. Um, and unfortunately, like this, like experience isn't unique. Like, obviously, the system exacerbates like structural impact of the hostile environment impacts people's physical and like mental health. Um, and, and I think that's a fundamental thing that people don't understand. The hostile environment policies are intended to make people live in fear. Mm. They create like an environment where people are precarious and they are unable to, like in this situation, you know, it's very difficult for this person to, to go through the process of disclosing what's happened. And, and, and this person has been undocumented for a, a, a significant period of time. They didn't, they've been here for more than 10 years. Um, and I think it's, I think it's like, we take, like it's obviously we've discussed this isn't this it doesn't just impact um people who uh people who are um migrants but it of like uh, i at the time was discussing with other friends who have experience of um sections and the the overwhelming thing was most of them were white they'd never been asked for id documents mm -hmm. so this was a, a perception that this person was maybe not entitled to care and it would never have happened had he been perceived as being a British citizen, which unfortunately has specific connotations attached to it. Um, but I think these sort of things are really important because to understand that we, you know, a lot of people who have, who are perceived as British citizens take for granted that they can just access healthcare. They get registered with a GP, they get a vaccine. Um, if they're ill, they, you know, if they're, especially in this pandemic, if they're struggling, they just, they have very, easy routes and it's not necessarily easy but they have easier routes to access things that they need at a specific time and I think that's the thing it affects so many aspects of people's lives um, and livelihoods and their families people around them that it is it's so it, it just it encompasses everything in their existence and I don't think people understand what that feels like um, we all struggle obviously this pandemic has has made mm. everyone struggle but it has made people who have uh, precarity because they're undocumented or undocumented struggle more and I think like the, the, uh, there's been like messages about this in the panel um, sorry in the in the chat like it's really important that these aren't and this is the same with rights these aren't strict um, laws change and terms change and so like part of what we do as regularizers focus on rights because rights are things that are much easier to and much tang much more tangible um, we can have things like, you know, limited leave to remain, but that might change to be something different in the future. So I think it's important that like, and this is the thing, it's basic human rights that people are struggling from receiving because of the hostile environment policies. And it's important to like highlight that for people, I think. Yeah, and that aspect of fear is, is massive, is huge. Like I know people without status that would not go try to register for the GP to get their vaccine because it, the I, and I don't blame them for being that scared of it, knowing what happened to their own friends and family members sometimes. Tashi? Um, yeah, I guess I can come with it with my own perspective a little yeah. bit about how I've experienced the hostile environment. Um, so I came here when I was seven years old back in 2003. Um, just me and my mum, we applied for asylum, which was a long and arduous process and took about 10 years, <laughs> so quite a long time, but uh, as James mentioned, that's com something completely normal for it, for it to um, fix it, but it was on, you know, from when I was in primary school all the way to when I was secondary school, and you couldn't, like, help but feeling that you were just like everybody else you know you maybe you'd had a little bit less um in terms of, of of what you could buy and there were so many restrictions on you but in terms of feeling like my peers feeling l like my friends it was just pretty much like an <laughs> kind of an ordinary childhood and it wasn't until you know certain um, expectations are put on you when you reach that into that adulthood stage they you start to feel that you're a little bit different I got my leave to remain when I was about 17 18 um, so this wasn't I wasn't undocumented so you know the hostile environment wasn't technically intended um, 
to with me in mind but I was unable to access university you know having le- having lived there for about 10 years by that time it's, it was completely an alien situation to me I had gotten like straight A's you know I had gotten like five offers from all my university's um, choices but um, I couldn't progress to a career in education um, and then even simply things like working um, every for so how leave to remain works um, in the path to settlement that I'm on it's a 10-year path to settlement so you have to apply for it every two and a half years and before every time you applied for it um, you they would the home office would request things like your passport um, you know right to access documents so I didn't have any like kind of proof of identity so um I I was I managed to get a scholarship to go to university and I had to pay for my university accommodation but I had no way of proving my right to work and every kind of every avenue that um, every employer that I approached um, said that oh you don't have a passport we can't like even you can't even go through the first step so we were me and my mom we were like on this on the brink of destitution just from not having a simple document I think this has made, been made clear you know there's not um um the two-tier situation it's it's it affects um people who who have every right to be here and who in your particular I even be seen sometimes as a migrant um and uh, maybe a more a more um recent example was I was trying to rent a a flat with my partner Um, and I made multiple applications to my landlord under my name which is Muslim name it's Tashi Tahir Um, and uh, I just couldn't get back any responses and as soon as he started applying with his British name like Tom Norman he's a white British man the, the replies just came coming in because there's that extra step and even though you know it's not intended to um, have discrimination against people of color that's what what ends up happening um, and it, there there's so many more instances that I can recall um, of the hostile environment and play um, even families um, with some some of the families that we work with um, they're often families of, of mixed statuses as well so you you can have families where um, the, the youngest child can have British citizenship, another young child can be un, undocumented, just because the amount of barriers there are in play um, to be able to even get regularised. British citizenship is even a further thing that some of us could even dream of, mm. um, to be honest. So <laughs> I think we're all there's so many cases that that I, I could talk, talk about, but I think would probably be here forever. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, your personal perspective is always so important to like what drives us to be involved in, in this activism and campaigning. Um, so now I'll move on to our like the last question that I have on our side, which is how the practical steps that we can take to again maybe not end it but in the short term at least make up the lives of UK migrants a little bit better but um, there's a question to you specifically Tashi so I'll start with you again how do you engage with hardcore Brexiteers like an MP that I communicated with once but yeah I think generally uh, I think before you mentioned that we have to speak to those who disagree with us Um, so I'll start with you but everyone else just question question on how Um, I engage with others who disagree and just generally points that we can do think actions yeah I think the most the most like important thing that I can maybe talk about is this persistence as well um you know keep going on it because most of the time I think a lot of these MPs will come with preconceived assumptions of where you're coming at the arguments that you are coming with um because a lot of times Margaret activists and, and Tory MPs that I'd have seen as like hard left activists um, and they will then put up barriers um, where, you know, you kind of have to um, appeal to their values. So we we mostly, when we approach them, we appeal to their values of social integration, um, family and fairness. And that for us has worked really well. Um, we also, the young people that engage with us are, are absolutely brilliant and probably the 
the reason that we've had so much success is because they're able to articulate their story in a way um, that I th that is really a, a positive narrative in, in the way that, you know, they're not kind of negating on the system, but speaking for the narrative and saying that these are the problems that I faced, but I'm still so passionate and so brilliant um, and, and kind of not, um, you know, it's always kind of starting from that negative stance. I think automatically brings a lot of people off and puts them off even listening to you at the entirety of your argument. Um, so and it, persistence and just having um, well, it, a little bit um, of, the, of the values perspective, um, because we, we, we used to, um, quite a lot of our campaigning was, um, we, we hold parliamentary events every every year to kind of, bring more of a focus on some of the issues young people face. And previously we'd hold them in parliament and we'd have each MP um, kind of sponsor us parliamentary event. Previously we had, we had Labour MPs and SNP MP sponsor because they were just the easier sell. You know, you could sell them about the hardships of, of young people who had lived here most of their lives, but they didn't actually negate to us actually um, getting anywhere with our policy asks. Um, and it's only recently when we started engaging more with conservative MPs that we've managed to break a little bit more ground in the policy that we that we've had. And even when when they have that conversation with a young person who is so brilliant and all they want to do is just get on with their life, I think that's the kind of key crux of it. You know, we're not asking for any special treatment we're just mm. asking for to live our lives norm normally and just contribute and give back to society they can't help but be um we kind of engage and want to know more mm -hmm. um so those are some tips and just persistence to keep writing and engage with them at like events and stuff that you most likely wouldn't um wouldn't go to as well yeah yes definitely um i don't know uh Sunita next please <laughs> Yeah, I think um, what Tashi said about like cross party support is really important. Um, I think we, we don't know what's going to happen in the next, we know for the next three years, at least we're going to have a, a, a conservative government, but beyond that, we don't know. And it's important to to acknowledge, I mean, we, we as regularise focus as well on engaging with um, where possible conservative MPs, because and um, without that, it's not going to necessarily be something that um furthers and changes um the narrative around um migration um i think also um for us like the i mean the focus for us is obviously we want to have a regularization program and attain basic rights for undocumented migrants and irregularized migrants um, and i think we have like various approaches and they're all important because it's not going to be something that is only done through parliamentary action is kind of engaging the public and un understanding like the human side of people's stories, but also giving people who have lived experience the tools to organize themselves um, and allow them, because I think it's really important for them to have agency and input into their decisions. Um, this isn't something, you know, as allies, it's important that we can, we can discuss stories and we can be um, maybe public facing where possible, but it is really important for it to be centered around um, those with lived experience. And a lot of um, like Ireland at the moment, they've, they've made a lot of um, like headway on this. Obviously they don't have a hostile environment, but in terms of a regularization program, that's something that's now being spoken about, but it has been a, a long-term struggle. And that's something that it's in our view is regularized. This isn't something we're going to overturn in like one or two years. This is a, a uphill struggle. We're trying to potentially reverse year, year, you know, year decades of law. And we're trying to, um, we're doing it at a time where things could be like more difficult for everyone in terms of the experience of the pandemic, but it's also an opportunity to see the, the impact that migrants have um, in the economy on different levels. And, and as you said, like, I think, uh, as kind of Tashi said, I think it's also important to, to recognize that, you know, um, a lot of, of the, the conservative MPs, when you discuss the reality of what it is for people living in the UK as a migrant, they kind of understand better that it's not, 
their reality and some some of them are migrants themselves and I think that's also important there needs to be like broader solidarity between those who are migrants or maybe who are children of migrants because the the system has changed there's a perception that it's very easy to regularize your status and at the moment there's a 20-year route which is essentially 30 years to regularize your status if you're undocumented the idea that someone is somehow supposed to live undocumented for 30 years and survive in under the hostile environment policies is quite frankly absurd for a lot of people and in it, in it makes them vulnerable so yeah i think um it's important like like things like this um like collaboration across um migrant groups and it's also important to build more solidarity like across groups that maybe you know we we tr really try to focus on intersectional issues because this doesn't affect just there are specific issues that maybe affect migrant women more more than um um like that are different and there are also issues that are around like racial justice and like racial like um, movements that are anti-racist need to be focused on like migrant rights mm -hmm. so i think it's not like migrant rights need to be separate and be discussed separately i think we need to build like broader like networks and i think you know that has happened and it is happening and that's an amazing thing that's going on but yeah we need to keep doing that Definitely. yeah thank you um james next please leads very, very nicely on to what I was going to say. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I think every approach and tactic that people are using to shift, uh, like shift these narratives and shift policies, is is super important and kind of works as part of a broader like movement of of like tactics that lead to change. But I think for us, where we focus a lot of our work is um, on building this kind of grassroots movement and network and like mobilization across the country that is in opposition to these policies. Um, I think when we look, I know I was talking a bit more optimistically about the past before, but I think when we look at the trajectory of these policies and the kind of move towards, you know, more authoritarianism, like increasingly, like boldly racist and discriminatory policies from this government um, and the and the kind of longer term cultural impacts these policies have on, on the country. So even if, you know, in theory, we could uh, erase all the hostile environment laws tomorrow, that's not going to stop people uh, who work in public services discriminating against people who are trying to use them now because that's been ingrained in them over years. So if we're gonna if we're gonna change those, it requires that that like level of of engagement with with the population and a kind of building of a, a kind of serious critical mass of people who both understand these issues and who are pushing for uh, you know kind of true commitment to like universalism and the true understanding of of like what it means to stand in solidarity and allyship with migrant communities. And that's like the broader sense of migrant community, not just the ones who are like lauded by the sun or the Daily Mail or whatever, as small as those groups are. Um, and that is like deep and long-term work that requires, you know, situating yourself in communities, building links and coalitions between different campaign groups and people with different interests and understanding how all of these things intersect and interplay um, and how everyone, you know, Build understanding and solidarity and a sense of shared interest and purpose in challenging these policies as a fundamental part of their work towards moving towards a more just and equality, equal, more just and equal society. Um, so yeah, that is that's the work that we do, and I think that's uh, and hopefully it builds a kind of sustainable base so that when we get policies changed and when we have success in Parliament and when we have success, you know, lobbying for these things, it becomes then very difficult to, to roll back on those policies. Mm -hmm. That's what is there is a, is a really a mobilized and hopefully militant movement who are ready to fight for those rights in the longer term. Um, and so I guess the plug, the Patients Not Passports Network is doing this across the country. Um, we have localized groups in towns and cities across the UK. So basically wherever you are, there'll be a Patients Not Passports group that you can get involved in if you want to work against the hostile environment in the NHS. You don't have to be a healthcare worker, you can just care. Um, and that's enough. That's the baseline to get involved. Um, I'll put my email in the chat so you can drop me a line or go to patients.passports.co.uk if you want to learn more about the policies and how to get involved. Yeah, all speakers, feel free to post things in the chat and Antonio can then copy and paste it into the Facebook uh, live as well so people know about you, your work and how to get involved. Uh, but finally, Shrinker, please. Um. I suppose I just want to echo what's been said already, which is putting a human face um, to all these discussions is absolutely crucial. Um, and I would say, go and see your MP and mm -hmm. create a sort of what we call in patients and passport is direct action uh, network of people around 
those who are experiencing hostile environment to make them feel safer. And I think that goes across the board, no matter what the issue people are facing, if we create a community of people around them. Um, because my experience has been that, and no matter who the MP was, which party they're from, once when they see the actual person that this policy is affecting, it, it you know, they have to be a, a very cruel um, person in order not to be affected. And only through that kind of gradual drip, drip, really consistent advocacy and campaigning, we will get to the tipping point where we can create a new normal. We need to create a new common sense which is that of welcome, of justice, of, you know, we need to come to the situation where regularizing people will be the only common sense option, because it is. Mm. Um, so, it, so that can feel daunting right now, but what we have to remember, and it's always, I always find this inspiration, you know, in those who struggled before me is, Steve Biko's famous words that most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So we must not allow ourselves to be discouraged and disappointed because it's going to be a long fight. So finding ways of working together. There's been, because of the pandem pandemic, I think I've signed probably hundreds of different <laughs> petitions and letters and postings, but that's fine because I'm collecting those emails and contacts to meet with all of those people once we're unleashed to start building <laughs> something in real life yeah. and be ready. Um, I'm slightly more optimistic. I think we're gonna might have another snap election and it's really important to be registered to vote mm -hmm. and to vote uh, to do those things. Um, and also, there's around 10 million of us and there's so many constituencies where you can go and look at how marginal they are. And if you turn out, um, you can actually make a huge difference on a local level as well as a national level. So I'm still, after all these decades, I have not been discouraged from um, democratic process. It's not ideal, but it's the best tool that we have. We need to push back around some of these measures that are illiberal and oppressive, like the policing and crime bill that James mentioned, and we need to join with other campaigners that are pushing back. And also these attempts to control us. So, you know, I used to be a proponent of uh, voluntary IDs because I saw it working well for immigrants in the US, especially for undocumented because it enabled people to open bank accounts. But now seeing how the suggested use is in this country, I'm against them. So we're allowed to change our minds. Mm -hmm. I had my second vaccine on Friday, but I wasn't in the system. And that information will be used to provide alleged or potential a COVID passport. So because the system is not functioning, we're affected. EU citizens will now experience that with our settlement scheme. Yeah. So we have to be very vigilant and also be aware that um, a lot of the time our bureaucracies are very good at enforcement, but not so good at providing services because that's not where the investment goes. So we have to be um, prepared for a long run um, platform and lift up um, lived experiences, but also as a part of the, the broader systemic challenge and broader sort of system literacy um, where we need to be pushing and also create these moments where when we can push. So, um, so yeah, so that's, I can be against the card because it can be used very badly. So if, if there was a system that was functioning, that would be fine. But um, I think it's also really important for us to remember, hostile environment is not a failure of the system. It is the system. The clue is in the name. So especially, you know, James mentioned data sharing. Um, that's why I don't trust this administration to have my details, to use them safely and in function of my rights rather than in function of control and enforcement. Yeah, oh, 
Thank you. Um, I mean, it's 11.30, but I think I've covered uh, some of the questions that were coming in from Facebook as well in some of my questions. But I think, yeah, like we've said everything. And, and just to bring my own my, my perspective on, on this as well is that we need to be mindful of the intersectionality of migration and like our identity in, in the UK. I'm from Brazil. I was born and raised there. But I was lucky enough to have Italian citizenship that allowed me to not face the barriers that my my friends from Brazil face and would face if they wanted to come to the UK. But there there there's so many different interfaces of migration in the UK, and we have to, as you said, like continue working together. Um, remember that even if something works for us, it may not work for others, and continue learning and and changing how we can improve ourselves to campaign for those that still don't have access to full services and rights in the UK. But I think it's been such a brilliant discussion. Um, when we, in the three million in the Young Europeans Network, whenever we talk about the hostile environment, we get questions asked about what it is. I think now we've got a perfect resource to send people to uh, and learn more about it. So thank you very much, everyone has come today. And yeah, I don't know if anyone has a final closing point. Otherwise, I think we're good to end here. No? Tashi? I was just going to say thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you.